Thank you all, and I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 5. That's where we will be looking uh, uh, um, that chapter for our study tonight. So let me read the introduction that you have on your, uh, you know, with you uh, on, uh, on the uh, handout, the outline that you have, the introduction. The opposed apostles, Acts chapter 5. The book of Acts describes the growth of the church from Jerusalem out toward the ends of the earth. And with that, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So this is the outward growth, the outward bound kind of journey of the church as it began in Jerusalem and then it began to spread to the ends of the earth and as a result of that spread, you and I have become beneficiaries of this saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus, back to, my, uh, to, the, to the handout, the outline, Jesus commanded his followers to be witnesses of the salvation from sin that can be found in him alone. And so again, in Matthew chapter 28, and I'm going to read that. We know that verse very well, but it's always good to remind ourselves. Matthew chapter 28 uh, and the, the last uh, three verses, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So you and I are God's disciples, followers of Jesus Christ, commissioned to spread this good news of Christ to the world. Back to my notes. But Jesus never promised it would be easy. Just as Christ experienced rejection and suffering, so will his followers. So as the disciples preached, the religious leaders opposed God's will for the gospel to go forth. In Acts chapter 5, these leaders thought that they could keep the apostles from preaching by throwing them in jail. However, an angel of the Lord opened the jail so they could escape and continue preaching. The church continued to grow through the sovereign Lord pouring out his spirit on people as they came to trust in Christ. Now this Sunday I invite all of you to come and uh, And uh, worship with us this Sunday because our sermon is actually learning to trust in God. And so this kind of lesson is kind of giving us uh, an idea of how these people actually came to trust in Jesus Christ. And as a result, or consequently, the gospel actually kind of spread to the end. But this happened in the midst of persecution and opposition. God hasn't promised us a bed of roses When we become believers, it doesn't mean that all our problems will disappear and that everything will be kind of just bright and and easy. Rather, we are called to participate in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. But just as Jesus suffered and died, he also rose again. So there's hope that even in the midst of our sufferings, we too will have hope and a place in God's kingdom. Please turn with me now to the book of Acts, chapter 5, and we're going to begin with Sister Doris, our reader. So she will read chapter 5, verse 25 to verse 
32. Follow in whatever Bible translation you have as Doris reads out uh, you know, for us. Acts chapter 5, beginning at verse 25. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went to his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Hmm. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty in this man, of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive us our sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so it is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Thank you. So as we do, thank you so much for reading so eloquently for us. Is there any particular verse here? Any particular um, kind of uh, idea or concept in what Doris read that actually piques your interest or captures your imagination? Is there anything? And you know the background. Uh, the apostles were out there doing many signs and wonders, preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And God blessed them. Uh, and they were able to uh, proclaim God's word. They were also able to uh, heal people, do all kinds of things. And now, the religious leaders, so that's why I started by saying when you become a believer, it doesn't mean your problems disappear. In fact, sometimes the problems will come from within. So these are so-called religious leaders or authorities. They know the scriptures. They know the, they know the Torah. And yet, they were determined not to allow the gospel to be proclaimed because they did not believe in Jesus, the Messiah. And so they kind of came and uh, threw these guys in jail and, and um, there were all kinds of things. So if you have your Bibles and you just, uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 17, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him that is the party of the Sadducees. And filled with jealousy. So there we go. Filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public prison, in jail. They threw them, they held them, you know, incarcerated them. But it's interesting that this time we don't hear the mention of the Pharisees, but rather the Sadducees. We know that. There were several, you know, uh, religious groups. But the two that we know very well are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you hear more about the Pharisees than the Sadducees. But historically, the Sadducees were the priestly group. They were also the aristocrats. You don't hear more about them, but really they were behind all that happened to Jesus Christ. The Pharisees were actually the people's people or group. They could interact with the, with the ordinary people. But the Sadducees were those who had their hands on the levers of power. And so the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish ruling council, as we call it, was actually staffed by more Sadducees than any other group. And so when Jesus was put on trial, you know those who were behind that mock trial, that false accusations and all of that, primarily those things were coming from the Sadducees. And so it's really interesting that in this verse here, the Sadducees are actually kind of singled out for mention. Yes, brother. Uh, at the bottom there. <laughs> Sure. And the Pharisees did. That's correct. And that's, the that's correct. And so uh, we have that also in the book of Acts. Uh, when Paul actually um, kind of threw them, 
into some kind of uh, you know, confusion because the, the Sadducees did not believe in something which, you know, so if you turn with me to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23, Paul is actually brought before the council. Acts chapter 23. Thank you, David, for, uh, Dave, for bringing this up. And so we can read it from scripture. As Pastor Daniel always says, I don't make it up. We, we have the scripture to go to for our answer. So join me in Acts chapter 23, and um, let me read from verse 1 uh, all the way to verse um, you know, you know, 8. Uh, and looking intently at the council, Acts 23, this is Paul. Paul said, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewash wall. Apostle Paul sometimes was bold. You know, the spirit was working through him. Okay, so he was able to, you know, call Ananias out. Because you are the high priest, you should know better. You don't do that. Then, uh, verse 3, then Paul said to him, uh, uh, yes, God is going to strike you, you white wash wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Verse 6. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension, in other words, a confusion, arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. Verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So this is a clear distinction between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection, in angels. The Sadducees did not. You know why? Because the Sadducees were just earthly. They, you know, everything was here. They didn't believe in the otherworldly kind of existence or that something is beyond this kind of thing that we see here. Because they had their hands on power. They were rich aristocrats. So everything is just here. Enjoy your life here. So that was why they did not believe in the resurrection. And because they did not believe in the resurrection, naturally they would not believe in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is saying, look, but I'm a Pharisee. I believe in the resurrection. And I believe in the hope of the resurrection. So thank you for bringing that uh, to our attention. So that's kind of the uh, fundamental difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the resurrection. So back to my handout. If you have any comment or question, please stop me, and we will let you speak in the mic, and our audience can hear you. In Acts chapter 5, 17, 17 through 24, the apostles were put on trial and sent to prison. But the Lord once again confirmed his plan by sending an angel to release them from prison. In one sense, the angel of the Lord was recommissioning them to continue preaching the gospel. Let me stop here. There is something in this statement here. God has given you and I life and freedom and liberty. And it's not for us to just sit and enjoy life. Just as these disciples who were hurled or thrown in jail were rescued by the angel of the Lord, it was their duty now. God commissioned them. You have been saved to save others. You have been blessed to bless others. And so they had to take the gospel message and then spread it. 
share with others. And so, instead of complaining about my situation, your situation, we need to thank God and use that opportunity to bless others. You know, life can be really hard. And so we need to thank God for your life, for my life. Maybe if you see somebody's life, you will say, well, thank you, Jesus, for who and what I am. God has been so good to you and to me and to our virtual you know, audience. We need to actually use that you know, blessing to bless you know, others. The next morning, the religious leaders discovered that the men they threw in prison were again preaching in the temple. Now, these guys were so stubborn. Thank you. Uh huh. Yes, it's on already. <laughs> they did what the angel explicitly told them That's to correct. do, which angels usually do. They give them explicit instructions on where to go, what to do, yep. and what to say. Yeah. So, what Sister Doris is saying is true. If you go back to Acts chapter five, and again let the Bible confirm what you just said, Acts chapter five. Uh, uh, verse 19. But uh, you know, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, look at verse 20, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And life is in capitals. All the words of this life. Who is life? Jesus Christ. The words that are actually about Jesus, who is the author of life. So go. So they were commissioned. You're right. The angel told them that they've been rescued for a purpose, for a reason. They haven't been rescued to just go home and enjoy life. No. They've been rescued to actually go out there and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of life. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been saved to save others. And I think we need to take that very, very seriously. But it's really interesting that these men were so bold. It's one thing hearing the word from the angel. It's another thing, really, because some of us, we hear the word from the angel, whoa, I'll take over. I probably would say, this is really scary. Yeah, that would be the natural thing that most of us would do. We take over. Well, if I'm saved... I better go home quietly. I don't want to get into this situation again. Yeah, sometimes it happens. But they did not do that. And so, what happened? The apostles knew, back to my notes, the last three lines of the first paragraph under number one, the apostles knew that the message they had been given led to eternal life and could not be contained by a prison warden or corrupt leaders. It needed to be declared with bold conviction. That's the word. Even in the face of opposition. Let's stick on the word word conviction. You and I, when we hear God's word, it cuts to the heart. It convicts us. It brings us something. And so out of that conviction, we also take that step, that leap of faith, and we share it with others. We need to be convicted first. You cannot share what you don't have. You cannot give what you don't have. If I write a check and we say this in Virginia and I know I have no money in the bank and it bounces, it's a crime. I just found out. So you got to get some money in the bank <laughs> because you write, a, you write a bounce check, you know, a false check for somebody, you can end up in jail. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Oh, yeah. ah. So they had to know what they were preaching. They got to make it their own first before they can actually step out. And by the way, another thing that is interesting, and it's true, we use the word conviction. People will know whether you're faking it or not. Don't kid yourself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. People will know if you're true to what you're saying or you're faking it. Any thoughts on that? Has that ever happened to you? Or have you seen that? Brother Dave, go ahead. I'm going to have to... Um, no, no, please. You just, don't mind me talking. I'm no. Gonna, but I, Go ahead and talk. I That's what notes on this. <laughs> Go ahead. Because these... Listen. listen. You have to have that... This, 
perfect word is conviction. conviction. But what you have to have with conviction is what we talked about last week. You have to have truth. Amen. And if you don't have truth, who's against truth? The Satan. devil. Satan. The devil. Satan. He's, what did Jesus say? There's no truth in him. Right? Yeah. There's no truth in them. So yeah. truth holds everything together. So yes. you're convicted based on what is real truth. So you yeah. got to know what you're teaching is true or you're a phony. Whew. Isn't that right? So the Absolutely. apostles, the apostles in this case, were filled with what? The Holy Spirit, and which truth. is truth. Okay? Mm. And then the truth gave them the conviction and courage to stand against the enemy. Yeah. But you and I have talked about this. You've got to be careful how you witness to others. You, uh, yes. can't, you can't bang their head on it, you know? No, you don't be a Bible basher. You don't bash them on the head <laughs> with the Bible, you know? you got yeah. to speak the truth in love and grace. Yes. And yes. I was going to... <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he, he's so, fired up. He's fired up, man. Well, I just didn't. <laughs> Amen. I just, you got to know how to, you got to talk a little, little bit of grace, yeah. truth. I'll, I'll give you an example. Yes, sir. Here's an example. There was a fourth grade teacher who was recovering from surgery. Yes, sir. And she got a get well card from her class. Oh, that was beautiful. Yeah, it read, Dear Miss Baker, your fourth grade class wishes you a speedy recovery by a vote of 15 to 14. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Dave. Thank you. Now, is that great? Is that great? <laughs> oh, man. That's good. Even one vote, above yeah. all, you know, could still make a lot of difference. You know, uh, thank you for sharing this in kind of in this, uh, you know, beautiful fashion for us. We love, but it's true. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Conviction. When we are convicted by the truth of God, it liberates us. It makes us free people. <clears throat> But then we are free to be a blessing to others. When we are set free, it doesn't mean that's the end of it. We are set free to also take the message out and bless others. And so I think this whole thing about what happened to the apostles and how they were rescued and you know, the, the, the command which the angel gave them, I think it's something that we should really learn from. That we too are God's messengers. In fact, uh, Paul talks about this, and it's a passage that we have read over and over, uh, and I, I think I'm going to read that. Uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, and Paul is actually uh, making this point uh, from verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 to verse 21. Very similar to what Dave has explained. I think we need scripture to back all these things that we're talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. I'm going to read it out. If you have your Bibles, you can follow me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation, the message of truth, as Dave has just said, that conviction. Then look at verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Who is an ambassador? Somebody who represents his country in another country. Yes. So we are Christ's ambassadors to witness Christ to the world. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. And then Paul completes this discourse with this verse 21. For our sake he, God, made him Jesus Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Beautiful, beautiful passage there. You know, God has given us this ministry. We are his ambassadors. We have the truth of God, and we need to share this with other people. And so back to my notes there. Um, what was the charge that 
landed the followers of Jesus Christ in jail in the first place. The charge is found in verse 28 of Acts chapter 5. Verse, you know, Acts 5, verse 28, when they were brought before the council and the high priest questioned them and look at verse 28, saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in his name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. But that's exactly what they, what they were commissioned to do from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will be my witnesses, beginning in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so the apostles were doing that. But there's also something that he says, that they are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood, the same verse 28. You intend by your preaching to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, how like that? So they knew the truth. They knew something about Jesus that what they were, the, the, the you know, apostles and disciples were saying what was true. But they didn't want to hear. You remember what Jesus said to them? Go to the highways and byways and wherever you will receive, preach the gospel. But if they don't receive you, what happens? You, sh- you shake the, the dust. Yeah. And so it's the same idea here. They want to make us guilty by actually, you know, talking about this man's blood. The blood of Jesus Christ is going to be upon their heads. May God forbid that this will happen to us. And so in Matthew chapter 25, 7 verse 25, which you have in your, in, in, on your handout, the statement that, you know, they were... Uh, filling Jerusalem with their teaching and that they are determined to make us feel guilty of this man's blood. It's ironic. Why? Because during the trial of Jesus in Matthew, you, you know what they said. Pilate comes and says, I find no fault in this man. So I'm going to wash my hands and let him go. And what was the chorus? Let his blood be upon us and what? Upon our children. Yeah, they say that. And now here they're saying, these apostles are what determined to make us feel guilty. Already they were what? Guilty because they've said it. Matthew 27, 25. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Generations. You see how fickle we all are as people. We, you know, we're people of convenience. When it's convenient for us, here we say this. When we go over here and it's, it's uh, not convenient, we say something else. But Jesus is counting on, on us to be men and women of principle. People who will stand for the truth of God, as, as uh, Dave said. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who will call sin by its right name. Men who will not be moved, even though the heavens fall. That's the courage that these disciples had. They were so determined to proclaim nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so the church must preach the gospel because when we do that, that's the only way repentance and forgiveness will be given. Let's go back to Acts chapter 5 and can somebody read from verse 33 to verse 40 for us? Acts chapter 5, beginning at verse 33 to... Actually, let's read all the way to the end, to verse 42. To 42? Mm -hmm. Okay. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put him to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, yeah, Gamaliel, yes. Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up, to in, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Hmm. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared claiming to be Somebody and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed and all the, his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God... 
you will not be able to stop these men. Mm. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Wow. His speech persuaded them. They, all, they called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Mm. Read up to verse 42. Sorry. Let's finish it. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of the suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from the house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's talk through this. Thank you. So, you see what is going on. Preaching Jesus brings opposition. And that's exactly what happened. So, verse 33, when they heard this, they were enraged. In fact, other translations would say they were cut to the heart. They were furious. So much so that they really wanted to do something to these, you know, men uh, who were proclaiming, you know, the name of Jesus. And so, they tried to do that. But you know the outcome. We saw this man, or we see this man, you know, Gamaliel. He's, you know, he was a Pharisee. You know, what he said is really interesting. You know, <laughs> there's something about proclaiming Jesus. God is God's own defender. You don't have to defend God. God defends himself through unlikely quarters. So one of them on the council, the, um, you know, this Pharisee, this kind of honorable teacher, Gamaliel, and we're told that Paul even sat under the feet of this guy and, and studied. So he goes to the council and says, hey, don't let us do what we're doing. And then he calls two people, Theodas and you know, Simon the Galilean, uh, and oh no, Judas the Galilean. And these are people in history who led an insurrection, Theodas. He led an insurrection. He claimed to be you know, something, wanted to fight the Romans, and the Romans came really hard on him, and they annihilated. They killed all his followers who were actually, you know, kind of uh, doing that mutiny. And then Judas the Galilean also did the same. So Gamaliel is saying, look, don't let us do this. If this is of God, nobody can stop it. But if it's false, it will fizzle out. So you see, from an unlikely source or quarters, God defended himself. You know, what this you know, teaches me, and maybe it should teach you, we don't need to defend God. No. God doesn't need your defense. In fact, God doesn't even need you and me to proclaim it. You know what John the Baptist said? If you are not willing to do it, God will call people from these stones, and they will do God's work. Ladies and gentlemen, we are just privileged to be called liberals with Jesus Christ. It's an honor. It's a privilege. It's an opportunity that God is giving to us. And if we don't do it, God will use another means. So this question that always comes up. So what would have happened if Jesus wasn't betrayed by Judas? I said to people who asked that question, I don't want to go there because God would have done what God wanted to do, regardless of Judas, regardless of anybody. God is sovereign, the sovereign Lord, the one who does what he does. Nobody can question him. And so this question, what people ask, well, Judas, we don't need to blame him. God used him to accomplish not too fast. Maybe Judas allowed himself. As we read from John's gospel, the devil entered into him. God didn't make any of us, you know, uh, uh, you know, de you know, you know demons or devils or whatever, but we allow ourselves to be used by the devil. You know the people who, who allow that to happen. Nice people, no crime, all of a sudden, they do something crazy. And then we are all kind of confused. Oh, he hasn't had any brush with the law. Oh, he, he is a clean person. Well, you know, we need to guard those avenues because the devil can use us anytime, anywhere, unless we stay close to God. But there's something interesting about this. Paul was a student. Yes, go ahead. Paul was a student of Gamaliel. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes. He studied under him. He, he did. Because you remember, he's a Pharisee, and Paul also was a Pharisee. Yeah, so he did study under him. So he knew Paul. There you go. God can do whatever, you know, you see, that's why we need to be people of grace. You don't know what God is going to do through you. You don't know what kind of, what influence you're also going to have. 
But there's something, thank you, Dorothy, you know, for that. But there's something that I like about this. When Gamaliel spoke in defense of you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Sanhedrin just brought you know, Paul and Peter and all these people and they flogged them. And then they let them go. And I like what it said in, go back to verse 40, 41 and 42. Verses 41 and 42. Thank you, Joanne, for reading that. Then the apostles left the presence of the council doing what? Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. What name? Jesus. The name Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, we should count it a privilege that God has invited us to be co-laborers with him. Tonight, I want you to know that despite opposition, despite whatever takes place, despite whatever people would do, God's message, the good news of salvation will continue. I mean, just think about it. Rome did whatever, you know, it wanted to do to shut down these kind of, this movement, these people who were proclaiming, you know, the message. But look at what it turned out to be. Christianity took the whole world captive. It just, it blitzed the world. You and I have become recipients. We are kind of, you know, people that have also been blessed. Let us allow God to do what only God can do. We are just privileged to be counted worthy to allow God to use us. Yes, Dave. I just want to say, to add to you, the whole dating, sir, the whole dating system of the world is based on who? <laughs> Jesus. Amazing. Amen. Incredible. Tonight, if you didn't hear anything at all, the truth of God marches on. No matter what you and I do, no matter what the, you know, the devil does, it marches on. And it's going to continue marching on until Jesus returns. You and I have been called to be part of this movement, part of this process. Let us be true to our calling. Don't let us get caught up in all those things that are just periphery to the truth of the gospel. That's what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to focus on those things so that we don't focus on things that matter. I think the apostles are an example to us. I pray God that you and I will allow God to use us for his glory so that one day when he returns, we will get that recommendation. Well done, good and faithful steward. You were faithful in just very little. Come, and I will set you over here. We will be, you know, kings and queens in the kingdom of God. I'm looking forward to that day. When Sister Doris and I will be there, and we will just walk side by side with all the saints from Parkwood marching on. And, and Oh, man, I can't wait for that day. Whoa, what a grand, grand day it's going to be. Hallelujah. And that's what, that's what we're looking forward to. Amen. Amen. I want all of us to be there. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's one there. Yeah, just, just push it from the, there's a white thing over there. Yeah, yeah it's on. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. um, very encouraging to, tonight. I Thank you. I just wanted to so let much. you know about uh, uh, what you were, uh, we were telling and you were uh, talking about it, like, uh, in Revelation says that uh, every knee shall bow and yeah. every tongue shall confess yes. and every eye shall see him, even, yes. the, even the ones who pierce him. Who pierce him. Um, uh, to me, that's an incredible thought because um, for those who don't believe or unbelievers, and still they're going to see him regardless. Amen. <laughs> regardless if you believe yes. or not. Incredible. I mean, of course, but, uh, and also uh, when you were talking about the, the blood, it kind of remind me of Abraham um, with the Pharisees and the in the Sadducees, because uh, Israel was the chosen people, yeah. but uh, with Abraham, he did. Uh, uh, the, I guess you can say the contract with God, with um, throwing the blood and yes, making that. Yes, you know, yes, and then, okay, all of that. You huh? know, like they, that's how they 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 can um, cover their sins for yes. the time being. But then yeah. John the Baptist says, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and became the flesh. The Word became flesh Amen. among and and live among us. And the power of God uh, back then is still the same today. Amen. In, in regards of power, in the sense that yeah. uh, they want to, uh, when Jesus was alive, they want to shut him down. Yes. 
And but then he had to go back to his father. And of course, and then when 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 the, the apostles were talking about Jesus, the, the same power of Jesus, they tried to shut them out as yeah. well. But regardless, um, the power of God is more because when the world uh, don't want to hear about Jesus, is because the prince of this world here wants to shut Jesus That's out. Right. Right. Um, but it's incredible thoughts in the sense that um, encouraging in the sense that uh, regardless if the devil wants to sh shut Jesus word or not, the, the people can still see him and every knee shall bow and every yeah. tongue will confess Amen. and see him too. Amen. Regardless, it's, hey, I don't believe in God. Well, whether or not you don't believe in God, that's, that's your issue, but you're going to see him. <laughs> We're going to see him. I like that. So don't fight it. If they don't believe in Jesus, you still do what God has called you to do. And I think it's going to be, that's a beautiful thought. I thank all of you for tonight. I know our time is up and we need to go down and pick up the children. So let's conclude with prayer. Almighty God, thank you so much for your word.